G'day guys, welcome back to another cracking episode of Level Up. We are back in the shed today for something a little different. We have had an absolutely cracking year with Level Up. Um, the guests we've had on, the conversations that have been had, the value that we've added to the industry and probably the biggest one for me and what's just going to make us keep making this thing bigger and better than ever is the feedback that we get from all you guys and girls that uh, watch and listen. So. Look, Shay's actually gone back through uh, some of the podcasts that we've put out this year and put together a bit of a highlights reel. And look, there was just so much great value that it would have been a seven hour podcast. So we've cut out the best bits and um, yeah, grab a cuppa, grab a beer, whatever you're doing, sit on the beach, sit back and uh, have a listen to what we got coming up. All right, so let's kick it off with the Seven Builders podcast. To have so many incredible builders in the one spot at the same time delivering value was just off the charts. Uh, the likes of Cole Zanetto and Matt O'Grady from Zanetto Builders, Craig Stewart, Brett Fowler um, from Sold Ash, Robbie and Dean from Evo Built, like absolutely off the charts. This podcast had a lot to do with um, or a lot of conversation around self-development and the need to constantly be working on yourself and your business. So uh, let's get into it. And so basically everyone sitting in this panel today is all getting some sort of coaching. Is that, is that right? Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you want yeah. to talk Definitely. about yours? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think being a typical male, male, everyone's ego and their their personality is something that prevents them from, from seeking help. And for me, and I know Maddie and a few boys, it comes to a point in your life where you hit rock bottom and then you've got to reach out because you just can't go on. Um, I think that social media has definitely put that option in the spotlight, whereas maybe 10 or 15 years ago before people had Instagram, you probably didn't have that accessibility um, or knowledge that you could just reach out and find someone. Um, and then for me, yeah, I probably, probably over four years, um, I was like everyone addicted to work, personal relationships really started to fail, family and all that, because all I did was prioritize work. So you're doing 80, 90, 100 hours a week and you just get stuck in that rat race of going round and round and round and then no, you can never finish work and that's the way I look at it. But back then you're like, all right, if I knock 15 hours today, I'm going to get ahead for tomorrow, but you'll knock 15 the next day, you'll knock 15 the next day. <clears throat> so yeah, business coaching for me was a step back to look at myself um, through, yeah, like I said, relationship issues, personal issues, health issues. Um, and it was something that for me was life changing. Um, my relationships now is 10 times better and I'm a better, more supportive partner than what I was back then. Um, and the influence that it's had on me with how I respond to people and just my day to day um, personality has had a massive influence. So for anyone out there that's looking at doing business coaching, um, for me, when I first looked at it, if it was two, three, four thousand dollars a month, I was like, fuck me, that's dear, like, that's a lot of money. But I can guarantee you within that first month, you'll make 10 times that. Um, and it'll also 10x your, your mental health. And that, that growth from that investment is exponential. So, um, yeah, there's no bad investments in yourself. So start with yourself, and the business will follow. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm a massive believer now. Like, if you're not right, nothing around you can be right. Your relationships, your with your kids, your partners, like your, your subbies, your employees. Like, you've you've got to be right yourself before everything else around you will uh, will flow on. But like, you're getting a, you do well. You do live like Bill, but you do some other stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. Live like Bill was the start of it, and and like these uh, some of these boys have mentioned, I I did hit rock rock bottom, and, and me and Dwayne have talked about this before on the podcast that I was I was out. I'd had enough. And I just something inside me wanted just to make sure I'd give it one more crack to myself, know that I'd give it everything and not just pull up short just because things were tough. But um, yeah, we got stuck into Live Life Build and, and that was just a, that was a three, three, four months of real intense. I got straight, like, I loved what I was seeing. I loved the whole course. I was doing it at all stupid hours of the, the night and morning. And because um, once you can find stuff that, like a lot of the stuff you know you should be doing, but once it's structured in a way that you can understand it and you can, and it's at a time in your life or in your business where it's uh, applicable, it's just music to your ears and you can't you can't do it, get enough of it. So, I've um, done that, but then I don't probably I delved into it probably for two like nearly too far for six months and and left and and left the personal stuff uh, way behind and um, 
so then I delved into a bit of a, a self improvement journey with Rising Kings, and that was um, that was the that was the icing on the cake. That's what made the two the two worlds come together really well. Yeah, yeah. just focusing on myself yeah. a bit more. I think the um yeah like the the big thing about business coaching like live life build is is the networking and the support and like when you're at that point at, and you're at the bottom you're at rock bottom you feel very alone. Um, if we were to be at that point in our life and we had that support around us of all these other blokes that have been through the same thing, I don't think it would have been as bad. Mm. So I think yeah that's that's the value in having a support network that everyone is going to go through the same shit. Um, and you got to understand that. You don't fuck up. You don't learn. If you don't learn. You don't grow. Do you? Yeah. So um, there's something about yeah. um, hearing it from people that you know have been through the same experiences. It's all good to have a business co- and and look, there's all these different coaches and mentors out there. But it's really being in a network where you know they've gone through the exact same things. They've been just as they've probably said they're they're retiring. They're putting out of the game multiple times, like all of us have in the early days. It's there's there's more weight to it when you you liaising with them people. I reckon. When I was uh, doing Elevate, I would sit there and almost laugh at the videos because I'm like, I'm like, I've got all these problems. I've, I've got, you know, my cash flow is not working. My client relationships are falling down. Um, my team could be better. All this sort of stuff. And then, you know, you listen to Dwayne or people in like the in the Zoom calls, and you're going, oh, everyone's in the same boat. I thought it was a me problem, and you just, you just like, you just like. Oh, everyone! Everyone's in the boat together, and then like you know, how Kyle and I reconnected. We were friends when we were teenagers, and then drifted apart. But you know, I came into his office, and I was like, "This is fucked." And, and he's like, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, 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 we, 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 we bro out on like the the things that we've done wrong. But then, but then we can use that energy to uh, to work together and and improve. And it's just like, you know, look at the, like, eight months ago, I was just alone. And like, look at this, this is unreal. This is, this is really cool. Like, I think there's a difference, but like, and you guys, you guys are, I think, nearly eight, ten years younger than I am. Like, I think there's a, with your younger guys, it's going to get taken a lot more seriously. Like, I know, like, I, I did similar things to guys when I was going through my troubles and they just say, mate, fucking harden up. It's the way the industry is. <laughs> and, and like, yeah. you'd, you'd, you'd walk out there going, fuck, like, well, if that's the way it is, like, fuck, do I really want Good to be doing support. this? Better harden up then. Yeah. It takes yeah. a generational shift though, doesn't it? Like, it's not mm. something that happens really quick. It's got to be these, us younger guys who, uh, you, you're getting information and you're from different places. Like, in the old school ways, when the way I learned my, my, the bloke I done my trade under, he was as hard as nails, like. Yeah, there was very, very uncompromising and it was his way of the highway. And yeah, I think it's a generational shift and people are starting to learn, yeah, a very different way. What do you think, Craig? Yeah, there's definitely changes. And from when I was an apprentice to when I was a young tradie and first started my time, people didn't want to help and communicate and connect. And like this shows this group here, but you know, people have realised that there's more out there, there's more needed and, and self-improvement is a big thing, you know, and networking. Whether you're networking with an architect, a designer, whatever, but builders who network are going to be better off. You're yeah, just, 100%. You're helping each other. And I think that's a big thing. And part of, obviously, this podcast, but just day-to-day life is if you've got a problem or got an issue and you can talk to someone else, even if they can't solve that problem, but listening straight away. Because someone's listening and taking you seriously is better than, like you said, they said, harden up. Well, it mm. doesn't matter what your problem was. They're not giving you any solution apart from see you later, don't want to know about it. Yeah. That's your problem. But as yeah. soon as someone listens and takes it on board, straight away there's you've got a connection. Straight away you feel that there's some hope. Yeah. That, and that's the big thing, I think. Yeah, because I think at the end of the day, like it it's a hard game. Like building is a hard game. I think it's it's been hard ever since it started and it's gonna be hard for the next thousand years. I, I think it's like we touched on off air before we started <coughs> recording, and something that I've really realised in the last couple of months, it's all up to the individual. Like it doesn't matter what programs and softwares and PDFs and systems and processes you have, if if you haven't got the mindset and open, like I guess openness to sit back and take it all in and have a crack, it's it's not going to go anywhere. So a lot of it's got to start with personal, which yeah. comes back to applying yourself. Yeah, you've got to apply. Yeah, if and sometimes it takes you to get to rock. Well, I, I think. <laughs> Both sounds, but every, I'm not sure about these young guys. But oh, it's a good 100%. place to hang out, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> what about like the the business coach that we were talking about earlier? They they're always um, really good with culture. They they taught us how to get a good team and stuff. 
um, and like talking about like vulnerability and speaking about rock bottom and shit. Not not that it was. I feel like it was rock bottom, but just a real hit in the face. One of our team <coughs> meetings, we used to have them in our shed. Now we've got an office and stuff, so it's like good to see the progression and whatnot. But one of our meetings, literally, there was, I think we had like 14 of us, and we're sitting in my garage just on, you know, $20 chairs from Bunnings, and we're all sitting around in a circle. And we're like, they're like, oh, we're going to have a um, bit of a conversation about how you're a CUNT on the job site. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit, like there's literally 13 blokes around in a circle talking about how I'm shit and, and just like just because like I've got a bad temper and like, like like that's one thing that I've worked on over like you know three or four years still flares up and I go ah, shit really gotta just like see it coming but yeah like two years ago I had a team meeting literally you know 13 people just sitting there going mm. you gotta stop being a c*** on site but it's so, the um, it's being showing your team and having vulnerability and giving them uh, like open, opening the, the gate to them to be able to uh, come to you with those sorts of problems is also a very um, yeah that's a that's a tricky one. So I think that through the business coaching that we had in the early days, and then that set us up to show the team that um, we always said to them if anyone's ever got a problem, come to us, please come to us, um, and and let's talk about it instead of just keeping it bottled up. And it's not just that one about you know problems with Rob. We've also had guys come to us that had really bad mental health problems, and, and I think potentially we even saved a life yeah, just from definitely. You know, just from having that that support network. Saying to the guys, you guys can come to us whenever when you want. Um, don't ever be ashamed of um, of expressing your feelings in this group because um, you know it's a safe space. Yeah, it's mm. a safe space. Yeah. yeah, how good's that? that what, you know, one of the one on. of our guys um, probably two years ago came to work and we were on a job site, a bit commercially and literally sat us down and he goes mate had a bit of an in-depth conversation are you okay looked real down and he's like he goes mate literally i was not going to come to work today and i wasn't going to wake up tomorrow and i was like Phew. i was like fucking hell i was like he goes but if i didn't feel comfortable talking to you boys about it he goes i probably wouldn't be here right now he's like he was literally had that mentality on the way to work and we're like far out we, we literally said we used to play golf a fair bit so I said, mate, come for a round of golf with us at Sarvo. It'd be good, fresh air. Took him for a walk, walked him through it, and just, yeah, just really opened up to him. And, yeah, he, he definitely progressed from there and got, you know, pretty, got better mentally, yeah, I, I suppose. I yeah, think, I think we've, it's been, a hard one, but. we've probably been too good of mentors because we, we set people up to succeed. Then come on now. Late. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. So our next cracking guest was Zara Dakota from The Healthy Home. This conversation I had with Zara was off the charts and I, I learned so much. I'd actually, I've stayed in contact with Zara ever since we recorded this podcast. I've actually completed her Healthy Home Mastermind course. And look, I think it is really, really valuable and important for all builders to be learning more about this type of stuff. Things like electromagnetic fields, mold condensation, the building materials we use and how they affect our clients. And look, even if you're not into it, just educating yourself on this stuff so that you can educate your clients or be able to answer your clients' questions is really, really important. Well, let's go back to electrical. How do you how do you solve it? Like, how do you solve the problem? Uh, yeah, so working with an EMF te- technician early on is a good idea. So getting, getting an assessment, getting them to come and assess uh, what the levels are like at the site and then uh, designing the home so that appliances that emit high levels of EMF, like your fridge, your washing machine, your meter box are not sharing walls with the bed head or an office where you're spending significant amounts of time. And then there's um, strategies that you can implement with the way the home is wired, where solar panels are placed, having the option of hardwired internet so that if the family wants to go down that path, they can. Yeah. And look, uh, we, we've actually done one job, actually probably in close to two years now, um, 18 months, that um, the client had listened to one of Amelia, the Undercover Architects, my business partner's podcast about the electrical currents and those types of things so we um it was the first time it ever been brought to my attention and so we put all the internet in a cupboard away from the bedrooms um we put um switches on things so she could turn the power off yep. um, to areas demand like- switch it's actually amazing that like i've been into that many homes where there's been someone in the family that has had uh, migraines or insomnia and in each scenario that 
person has been the one in the house either sleeping next to the Wi-Fi router or the Wi-Fi router is next to the desk desktop. So I think there are many more people than we realize that are not feeling their best day to day because and they, they just, you know, they just think that that's the way well, it is but yeah, it, it's been it's safe it's in my house so yeah I, but something is like i had a i had a client who had she had twin girls that were just under one year old sleeping in separate rooms but they both had um baby monitors at the end of their cots and they weren't sleeping very well and i had um a meter and the the wi-fi the radio frequency radiation levels at the cots were the same as at their wi-fi router so she turned the baby monitors off that night and she messaged me two days later and she said zara my girls have slept soundly for the last two nights. They slept to 8 a.m. this morning. So yeah. like, that's just such a simple change that has made such a big difference to yeah. those two baby girls. Yeah. So there is, is that part of what you do? Or is that another specialist that deals with the currents? An things? EMF testing technician would deal with that. Yeah. I, I can certainly advise on strategies that you can implement in the design and I can look at, you know, potential nearby sources. But uh, if you're yeah, wanting tailored advice specific to that yeah. um, project, then an EMF testing technician. This next young fellow was such a blast to have a chat with uh, Josh Ford from New Age Electrical down in uh, the Boron Bay sort of area. I tell you what, he was so enthusiastic about being authentic and building a brand that really represents who you are and shows that your company is just an extension of yourself. Especially Brand's now, important, yeah. isn't it? Like Brand's I mean, important, So yeah. many people overlook the power of their brand and especially these days, personal brands. like. It's a big yeah. part of business. And it's hard. when you. I guess when you look at Instagram, you're putting your whole brand out there and everything you do and you can put all your work out there and you're putting it out there for the world to see. So creating a brand around that, I don't see it any dissimilar from creating a clothing brand at the end of the day. You know, like you want to get people involved and people to follow along, then create a brand that's the best way to do it. And I think we've done that from day one, creating a good logo that stands out and just updating Instagram with everything we're doing and... And, it, and I think it's worked for us. So definitely something that needs to be done for anyone starting a business, that's for sure. Uh, and anyone with a business. Like it, yeah. it's, uh, it's putting you out there, your beliefs, your cultures, all those things, like your, your work, your team, like all your interactions with your clients, the work you do. Like, yeah. So it's, your brand is like ultimately what's going to attract you, the right type of clients, the right type of employees, the right type of suppliers all those types of things so well it's what sets you apart as well so say you know in our area there's a hundred electricians like yeah. why are you going to choose us if if i don't have an instagram and i don't have something that stands out or i'm not using instagram how do you know who i am or what we do you know yeah. what i mean like it's the times have changed from word of mouth is so good but the times have changed from that where it's like you know especially where we live in byron there's so many people coming like developers and builders from here or melbourne sydney come into the area that they don't know the local trades to get any feedback from other people or, or yep. people there so what do they do they're going to jump on google they're going to jump on instagram they're going to be searching local electrician who and then we've built our website to make sure i know it's the best in the area yeah. without pumping our tires up i know it's good i've pumped so much time and effort into that working real real hard to make it look sick it's got videos on there it looks really good so that's the first impression of our business and that's not brand. only um I think it's more than that. Like, I think if you, like, you can tell how passionate you are. You, yeah. just, you can hear it in your voice. You can see it in the, how excited you are sitting yeah. in the chair there. Like, <laughs> you, um, it, it does so much. Like, you're, you'll be inspiring other electricians around Australia, around the world that yeah. come across your page, see what you do, see how you put it out there, see yeah. how you look after your team, all those types of things. Like, so it, the power of it is enormous. And I think so many people don't realize the power of it. Like I know myself, I avoided social media for so long when it first came out, but um, I just harness it with both hands now. Like it's incredibly powerful. And uh, it's the main reason why all of my businesses are the way they are and as, sex as successful as they are. Well, it's how like I reach out at you, find you, you know what I mean? Like it's, it branches you out in different avenues to find well, yeah, different... it's why you're sitting here today. That's it. Like, right. you know, if you, if, you didn't, if you don't do it, it's almost that thing, you're going to get left behind. You know what I mean? I know there's some guys that... There's some older, older builders we work for that haven't really branched into that. And then, you know, the industry ch has changed so much, especially where we are. And there's all these young guys coming up and they're getting all this crazy architectural work. And I know the older builders are going, how the fuck are they getting that? Well, yeah. how are these guys getting it but it's like they're prevalent like you know yeah. like they're relevant they're prevalent they're in people's faces like you know yeah. that's what they're probably going out of their way to chase that work and, and that's why they're getting it well they're putting it? people People can see you yeah. like, people can see what you do like the 
I, I like to say it all the time. Like I think social media is a new word of mouth. Like yeah. word of mouth is obviously the best type of work, and people are uh, people are still going to be referred to you. Mm. But I'm a personal like my personal opinion is the number one thing people will do when they hear about you is go and see if you've got an Instagram yeah, account. Yeah, look you up. And if you don't have an Instagram account where they can't look at photos yeah. and things, like what else are they going to see for you? Like, and nine times out of ten, if you haven't got an Instagram account, you've probably got a twenty-year-old shit website. Yeah. So how are people going to know about you, what you do, the, the quality of your work? Well, that's, I think it shows how passionate you are as well. If you've got a, a good website and a good Instagram that puts all your work out there, it shows that you you care about the work you're doing and that you did you know what you're doing as well because yeah. you know you could you could hire an electrician and you look on their instagram there's nothing on there or their website is generic photos and you're going like this like i want to do this amazing architectural build how do you know that guy can do it because not everyone yeah. just because you're an electrician doesn't mean you can do the right work that everyone else you know that you want done yeah. doesn't mean they can do it just because they're an electrician so that's where it's going to make those people like especially designers say designers are going to be looking at our page and we the houses we put up the architectural houses all that sort of stuff and they're going to go, well, these are, you should be using these guys because they've already done it. Yeah. But the other guy, they go, oh, we want to use this guy. He's our local electrician. And they go, has he done this sort of stuff before? Like, I don't know because I can't see his photos or anything like that. So. Yeah. All right. So if you're having a little bit of trouble finding the ideal client, the ideal job that you want to be doing, then these two next guests, seriously, they're, uh, they took this conversation off the chart. So we had David from EcoWise Homes and Anthony from Outlier Studio. This podcast, I think it was one of the longest podcasts we actually did, but seriously, it was just complete value, start to finish. And there was a lot of conversation about qualifying your clients, um, putting systems and processes in place to attract the right type of client so that you can be doing the type of work that you want to be doing in your business. So, so how does it work for you two? Like how, how do you work the process? So, depending, the lead could come, uh, so it could be an inquiry from either of us and we'll then make that introduction to the, the potential client. Yeah. Um, we kept it separate um, as far as the business side of things go, but uh, yeah, it's usually just a, an introduction to begin with. Um, we we'll do our typical vetting processes and things as such, you know, an inquiry form, make sure that it's the right fit for both before proceeding yeah, any both further. Yeah, we're very big on qualifying the clients, that's the thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah. how are you doing that? Um, so I use Google Forms. So um, someone reaches out to me, I've, I might spend a few minutes on the phone with them, um, but then, you know, refer them back to the Google Form, which I'll email through to them, and then, um, yeah, get for them to send for their plans that they may have and get yeah, a series of questions in there. And then... Um, what, what sort of questions are you asking? Just like um, what their budget is or what they're willing to spend, um, what's the most important thing, the project's built on time, the budget or attention detail. So obviously if they sort of say budget, you're like, oh, hang on, that's probably may not be the right one. But I've had clients that do say budget and then they actually worked out okay and, you know, had a great relationship with them. Um, and then just like what are they looking for in their, you know, um, their builder, what are they looking for for the performance aspect. Um, there's a few other ones in there like have you got finance, what stage are you up to with your design, that sort of thing and that. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, a phone call obviously, um, qualify them again just to chat and then I'll sort of, you know, pretty much give them a free sort of if, – if they qualified after that, give them a free sort of hour for me to go through and sort of explain to them what I do is operate, how I operate differently as a builder yeah. um, to most builders and, um, yeah, just see how it goes from there, yeah. Do you yeah. – um, I, I think the inquiry form is such a powerful tool. Yeah. And I, like – like everything we do now, like everything's constantly improving, nothing's set in stone and like we've definitely learnt, um, like we got pretty strict on our inquiry form for a long time and there was a lot of jobs we said no to like if mm. they didn't fill things out um, whereas now we're sort of back to we're educating the clients a lot more. Yeah. So I guess just to give the listeners a bit of an idea, like so ours, there's four, four, like I think we have about 12 questions but there's four questions that, we focus on. Um, yep. They yeah, have to fill out the good ones. Go yeah, back to them, they yeah. have yeah. to fill out them all. Yeah. Because like, for me, if if they don't fill out one question, generally that question is the budget. Yeah. Is like if that's a that's the first point for me to see if they're going to follow me and treat me like a yeah. professional. Yeah. And if they don't value my system, how are they going to treat me for the whole job? Yeah. So for me, that's a big yeah. um, tick box. But so my my four that I really focus on are. Um, site location. Yeah. Like we will not do a job anymore that's on a main road, intersection, near a school, in a mm. parking area. <laughs> like yeah. you can lose tens of thousands of dollars yeah. just yep. with that sort of shit. Um, and then we ask them for um, 
to a type of job and we give them, uh, it can be a new build, a renovation, an extension or a lift and build under. Yeah. We ask them to give us a, a brief outline or scope of work that they're looking for. And then our, the most important one is that their project spend. Yeah. And yeah. like from those questions, like just an example, like if they tell me they want a lift and building underneath, uh, their scope of works is a new living area, two new bedrooms, a, a laundry and an internal stairwell mm. and their project spends 500000 to me, that's a no-brainer. Like we can make that work. Yeah, yeah. But if they say that they want a lift and building under, they want a living room, two new bedrooms, a laundry, an internal stairwell, the kitchens and bathroom upstairs renovated, a new deck out the back, a carport, yeah. and their budget's still five hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. In the in the past, we would have we would have gone back and said, "Oh, look, we really apologise, but at this point in time, we're unable to help you." Yeah. Whereas now we go back and go, "Oh, look." Um, thanks very much for filling out all the questions. Really appreciate your information. Um, from our experience and the data on our current projects, we estimate for the scope of works and the type of job that you've told us you're after, your project spend really needs to be 650 to 750. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually surprising the amount of people that come back and go, oh, fantastic. No one's actually told us what we want yeah. to cost. There is, a, is a, like a, a portion of people out there just generally don't have any idea how yeah. much it costs to build, isn't there? Like, yeah, um, so that one mm-hmm. extra email yeah. to educate them on what yeah. it possibly might cost either goes two ways. Either, you're either never going to hear back from them again yeah. because they're like, oh, fuck that. Like we can, We've been told we can get it built for $400,000. Or you get the ones that are like, oh, mate, fantastic. Like, can yeah. we have a meeting? We'd love you to educate us more. Like, yeah. It's um, that whole inquiry, well, we call it the pack process. Yeah. Like, it's an, yeah. so good. Yeah. It, it, it really is like, it's, it, I think it's a game, been a huge game changer for my business. Like, going back, you know, when I first started, I'd get a phone call and we'd be like, you know, chew the area off and, you know, then we'll jump in the youth the next morning and we'd be on site like, oh, what can we do for you and that sort of thing. <laughs> and then like, like now I, I call it hurdles. Like, and, you know, I sound bad, but I try not to spend that much time with wasting t- my time with clients that aren't even a client. Like yeah. I'm all about, you know, like send them an email back and say, you know, I do believe it might cost such and such to do your job and that sort of thing. But again, try and do as quick as efficiently as possible. And that's where that Google form is really amazing that it can, you get a series of information that, didn't take you really any time apart from to send that email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, the next thing is taking it next level, mate. And uh, embed it, we embed a little video in our like three minute yeah, video, nice. and it yeah. just yeah. Uh, I I can tell that one video like because that's fifty phone calls. Yeah, like I get so asked, you get asked the same question all the time. Yeah. So we just answered the heap of questions in like a three minute video. Yeah. The number one thing we explain in that video is why it's so important they tell us what their project spend is. Yeah, because that's the number one question people hate answering. Like, yeah, yeah. I think you get told a different figure to what I get told. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's happened a few times. But there's also been some great examples where that project has just, like, they were unrealistic with their budget and stopped right there and for the better. Yeah. You know, like that was the best outcome for yeah. that person at that time was to yeah. put the brakes on and not go go forward with it at that um, unrealistic budget. Yeah. And, look, they may find someone who says, yeah, I can do that, but we all know they're going to end up at the same place where they yeah. shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where yeah. like the builder involved is so important. Like with the first sort of pricing we can do, like there's a lot of assumptions that are made, like, you know, it might be concept stage, we probably don't have any, you know, structural engineering and that sort of thing. So we are making a lot of assumptions as far as, you know, maybe structural steel and all sort yeah. of stuff, but at least – you know, you're sitting down and spending, you know, the three or four days worth of work in it to, to get your figure and that sort of thing. And, um, and yeah, as you said, it can be a red flag and say, no, that's well and truly above our budget or hang on, let's remove that second balcony area or the, the fourth yeah. bedroom and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. The only thing I'd say that I do probably further because we have an inquiry form, it's a Google Doc as well, is we actually have a few statements and we just want to make sure they align with that. And one of them is, you know, um, how do you see this home? Do you see it as a commodity or do you see it as a place for you to live with your family? And if it's a commodity for resale, then we're probably not going to be aligned. Yeah. And, you know, we try and just throw a few of those thought-provoking statements out there and just see how that sort of fits with them. Um, and that's another way that we sort of, yeah, another thing we put into that inquiry form as well. But I like that video. That's a that's, great idea. Look, yeah. That is, uh, to me, that's how you add value to your business, isn't it? Like you want to be aligning with people that have the same or very similar beliefs, values, opinions, yeah. all those types of things because it, it it doesn't only make them treat you as a professional and respect your opinions and, and the service that you're going to be delivering to them. It, it just makes a far better relationship. Straight away. Yeah. 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 Like instantly you know that you're going to be with someone who's like-minded and you're going to, you know, 
hopefully get along really well and have a because ultimately we're looking at the, the outcome and it's the project and we're project focused and that's what we want to be able to do is provide the best outcome so um i mean what um what have you sort of found when are you client focused or project focused like what's it typically for you when you look at something is it you want to have the best possible clients regardless of what the project is itself or for me it's so we, we've really changed our tune on this so when uh Actually, it's nearly t- it's ten years ago now when I first started reaching out and getting some mentoring and coaching and stuff. And um, everyone, the, like I tried five or six different coaches, and everyone said you've you've got to find your green house or your red house. Like you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went down that path. And um, whereas now we are all about the client. Yeah. Like I don't care, I don't care what type of job it is, whether it's a new build, a renovation, an extension, a, a fifty thousand dollar carport or a five million dollar house if the client doesn't have the same beliefs and values as me then it's not worth me working for them now when we talk about leveling up the building industry seriously this next guest chris from cma homes has absolutely taken it to the next level he has started a business from scratch with his family that is now turning over 90 million plus dollars the thing with chris is he has a real thing about setting expectations and building culture in his business and he talks about how he has used that to get his business to the next level how do you go like finding staff now like because like as as any business grows like Mm -hmm. when you've come from like someone like yourself that's had a go and you've Mm -hmm. you've know how to do everything yeah like do you sit back and go oh shit like they're too slow or i could do it quicker than that Uh, look my office will tell you i'm the hardest man to please uh so they will definitely say that uh (laughs) when i give a compliment to one of my staff member they know that is genuine i don't compliment you know i don't say are oh, you doing a good job if you're not i will i will say it how it is yeah. uh, but when i say something you know it's really true i guess so look i set a yes standard and yes it's high but how i feel is as the business owner i feel like a like a coach right and this is my team and i have to set the 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 uh, sort of example and i have to set the the uh, standard and if i set the uh, standard low this is what i explained to them you know my my whole goal is for you to be the best at what you do yeah. you, you know same thing with the site supervisors you know how good does it feel to know that if someone wants to build they want you to be the site supervisor how good does this feel like and this is how i want everybody to to feel so yes i set a high standard but um i wish i could train more like obviously it, it, it's hard with some once i think i've got a team of 45 now so it gets just a little for, bit hard like, the, just work directly for cma yeah yeah so direct employees we've probably got yeah 45 um so we got site supervisors obviously office draftees estimators and uh, yeah well you need a lot of staff to do 250 plus we do we do and we, we we're pretty much on point staff wise you know we could possibly do it a, a little bit extra but uh i've built i guess a bit of a culture where you know it's hard work and and like most of the these of people i have they love what they do and I, I would never employ someone that's just really good at what they do but they don't enjoy it i feel it's yeah. just it's just not gonna work yeah I, especially I feel, with the culture that you're building yeah in your business. it's um it's pretty much yeah so i feel like i'm a coach i feel i'm here like every day to like pump everybody up and like <laughs> answer uh, questions and solve problems and this and that yeah. and uh because it's hard you know it's it's home building and 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 people don't don't sort of realize, but when you look at how much work it takes for a builder to build 10, 20, 50 homes, like it's a lot, a lot of work. And if they saw, if a client saw the work behind the scenes, like man, it's it's incredible amount of work, incredible. And for everything to run as smooth as possible, it never runs smooth, obviously, because it's home building. But for, uh, <laughs> for it to run as smooth as possible, fuck it, 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 it is. It, hard. it, it takes like- a lot of work. I'm very much a, a, a detailed man, so you know, if there's a hundred dollars spent here, I'm, I'm gonna it and i'm gonna ask why you know and so I've, I've been a bit hard on them and they can see that and and what i said to them in look i'm the hardest uh, person on me you know nobody's gonna be hard on me than me and um it's hard because as much as i feel like i'm yes i'm doing well and i i, I want the young entrepreneur thing and all that i feel like i haven't started like 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 i have just started this is how i feel you know so i feel like i've only scratched this sort of surface i feel like we can always improve our customer service and we can always build better houses so how do you like how do you go about employing so you would be using a lot of contractors yeah yeah yeah, how how do you qualify them and and make sure they're up to your standard most of the guys that we have in terms of uh subbies conquerors everything they've been with us for years and years and what had happened is they've grown their their business with us now sometimes it's hard say we we've got like 
like a few painters and we've got a few uh, dollars and all this. So those trades, sometimes they don't scale that much. But for example, if I take our cabinet maker, he's fully scaled with us, does 100% of the CMA home. If I take our stonemason, um, when I met him, same thing, he was a really small stonemason. Now he's got a huge factory, does 100% of the CMA work. Um, so a lot of them have, have just scaled with us. And uh, the new ones, yes, it's hard. And I always say to my team, like set the expectation. Before he even starts a job, set the expectation this is a critical part if they don't know what you expect and if they don't know what you expect it's never going to work out oh, we, um, i talk about that so much like that that is across the board that's oh, with your employees sure. your contractors and, and especially with, with your, your clients. clients yeah, yeah. Like you've got to set an yeah. expectation right off the bat about that's right how you're going yeah. to deal with their job, execute their job right That's from right. the first time you meet them and talk yeah. to them. Like. Exactly. And sometimes it's hard, you know, sometimes I've got, we may have like a first-time buyer and they literally have no idea and they think a house is is perfection and, and just got to explain, you know, it's it's built by hand, everything is built by hand. So yes, there's standards, uh, which we have to obey to, um, but yeah, you, you know, you can only push it so far. A house is still all built by hand and don't expect something because it's just not going to happen, I guess. Yeah. So sometimes you have to just set the expectation and at all stage of the bill, I said to my sales team, you got to set the expectation at sales stage. Start supervisors when they meet a client, set your expectation at that stage and just, just keep going as you go. The worst thing you can do is just not set anything and then it's just free you, fall. Um, now, one of the key things to having a successful business is knowing your numbers and your data. I bang on about this all the time. The next guest we had come on the Level Up podcast was Katie from Profit First for Tradies. This conversation was just absolutely awesome. Hearing some of Katie's stories, real life stories from clients that she works with and some of the struggles that she sees them constantly having was just really, really awesome. And the feedback we got from this podcast was next level. So look, sit back and really take it easy. If you haven't listened to the whole podcast with Katie, go and check it out because seriously, knowing your numbers, knowing your financials and dealing with someone like Katie that can lead you in the right direction is super, super important. What do you do to get sh traders in shape, I guess, with their numbers? Firstly, traders are actually real, as you say, they're really good at numbers and you're actually really good at following a system once you have a system. Mm. I've never worked with a tradie that hasn't been able to pick up profit first. And I have heard it all. I've heard that I left school in year nine. I'm, you know, I've got all these other issues. I'm not great with numbers. Um, but when you're given a system, you are actually really good at following the system. You just have never been taught a system. And that's what I always explain to clients. I'm like, if you think back to like day one of your apprenticeship, could you read plans properly? Could you like plan things out? Could you map out, you know, the next six month schedule? Could you do any of that? No, it's the same with your financial system. You've never been taught so we have to go back to that like day one of your financial apprenticeship and start from the beginning and that's super uncomfortable for most people which is why they ignore it and what i find is um i always talk about a fun your financial team you have to have a really amazing financial team to help you in your business just like you've got great staff members and you know great um subbies and so on you've got to have a really solid financial team and unfortunately for the and this is not them not all of them but for the most part accountants are amazing but sometimes they lack a little bit of being able to explain the financials to a client in a way that really is just simple and basic and makes sense to them and what we do and i did myself originally when i was in my business have that conversation with the accountant you're like i'm not really sure what he's talking about I won't ask the question because I feel like an idiot. And then next year you have the same thing. And then it just kind of snowballs. And the same with many bookkeepers. They're great at their craft. They're great at what they do, but they're not so great at, the, at being able to communicate what's needed, what's missing, what areas need the focus. And I think because of my financial planning background, I've always looked at where are you now? Where do you want to be? What's missing? And I've always had that kind of mechanical mind. I've always wanted to pull things apart, see how it works and what's not working. And then let's put it back together so it actually works. And I think that plays well for me because that's what I do with businesses. I may not have become the motor mechanic, but I'm certainly a mechanic when it comes to looking at businesses. And whilst I have a bookkeeping business, I don't refer to myself as a bookkeeper. I kind of sit between the two and I can almost 
interpret what they need to tell you and then be able to explain it to you in a way where you go oh okay i get that that's easy why couldn't they have just said that and it's just because everybody's kind of speaking a different language and you just need to have that team around you we need the amazing tax accountant we need the amazing bookkeeper you also need the person who's going to be able to help you put the financial systems in place so they all talk to each other and they all make sense in a really simple and efficient way and that's what i find when Profit First is set up properly, it should be a 15 minute review a week max. Yeah. Even um, if you're a multi-million dollar business. It's funny. So one of the first things we do when when we get builders into Live Life Build, like um, we've created what we call our overhead calculator. So we get them to fill it out, put all their data and stuff in, and um, then they they can book a call and we talk about goals and things. And nine times out of 10, that first call, it ends up being completely chewed up just getting them to understand what it's actually costing them to run their business. And I know for me, like that years ago when I um, was doing some, like spoke to Sean, I went on his podcast because we were doing lots of the same stuff and we started implementing um, his version of Profit First. It was very good because like you have no choice. Like when you when you do the Profit First way, like one of the first things it does is shows you, well, I need to I need to know what's taking to run my business. So I need to increase my my income because when I do the Profit First, there's nothing left. So it's, it's it very it makes it very clear on where things are going wrong. And it, it just, and I always say it raises that red flag for you. And then you have to consciously go, oh, I'm going to ignore that. Like it's there for all to see that you don't have enough money in that particular bank account for those bills or whatever it may be. You can't hide, which is uncomfortable for the business owner to start with. But once you get through that initial phase, like anything, when we do something new, it's uncomfortable for a while, but the benefits far outweigh that uncomfortableness. And just knowing that you've got money in the bank to pay the wages or to pay the BAS bill or to pay, you know, the end of month bills. Um, it's the one piece of feedback I get from everybody I work with is like, oh, like I didn't realize how stressed I was until you take that stress away. And then they're like, oh, actually, business is not as stressful as we thought <laughs> once yeah. you manage the financial side of it. But for, for people that are listening that don't, don't know i've never heard of profit first like in, in a nutshell like what what is profit first like what's the the principles of it yeah so quite simply if you think back to our grandparents or our great grandparents you know our grandfather would have gone out he would have done his work for the week he would have come home with some cash given it to grandma and she would have put certain amounts in each different envelope for different purposes and once that envelope was empty you had to get resourceful and it's a similar sort of concept but for business and we use bank accounts nowadays because we don't need to be getting cash out so you will have a number of different bank accounts so when we set up profit first my version we start with seven bank accounts accounts which may seem extreme and it may seem like it's more complicated and for the bookkeepers and accountants out there that may send warning bells off in their head they're like that's going to be a disaster it actually makes it easier when you have your different bank accounts labeled for a specific purpose so all the income comes into the first one and then from there you make sure you put your money aside for your gst you put money aside for your materials and sub you put a small portion away for profit to start with because most businesses aren't profitable um, and we want to put a little bit aside we make sure we put money aside to pay ourselves because if we are not paying ourselves properly out of the business we need to do something about that because we just have a really big headache we want to put money aside for tax and we want to put my, and what's left is our operating expenses and you do it in that specific order and there are other bank accounts depending on the business but that's kind of the basic framework and if you don't have enough money in your operating expenses to pay those regular bills at the end of the month then that is not profit first not working it's profit first working because it's showing you that there could be something wrong with your pricing your quoting um your timing the are you sending invoices out when the job finishes or are you sending them three weeks later um there's a whole range of things are your are your operating expenses just too high are your staffing expenses just too high and by having the different bank accounts it tells you where you need to look whatever bank account you don't have enough money in and then it's like okay great so for this one then we'll look at this so coming back to the expense review the very first thing i do with all clients is do an expense review it's something that they dislike 
the most, but the, the amount of clients that I have, it's my, one of my favorite things. I love it um, because it's really easy to find. So I always explain that if you think about your um, operating expenses account as a bucket, it's got all these holes in it, but you don't know what's causing the holes, but you just keep working hard thinking um, the bucket will fill up eventually if I just work harder, I work harder. And what happens is you burn out and you get sick and the money still leaks out. So we have to patch that bucket first. And how do we do that? By doing an expense review. And the amount of times I always use one client from many years ago, I had encouraged him to do this expense review for a number of months. And he was like, no, we're all good. Like the business was going okay. Don't need to do it. And when he finally did it, he found a uh, insurance policy, $72, still coming out of his bank account for a car that he had sold five years prior. Yep. He called the insurance company. Thankfully, they refunded him two years worth, but that all adds up. And I use that example every single time. And the amount of clients that laugh and go, oh, that's ridiculous. Like that would never happen. And then come back to me and go, guess it's what I just found. It's happening every day. <laughs> All right, so this next guest, I would like to say, has become a bit of a buddy of mine. We've known each other for a long time now. Chris Cahill from Prime Built uh, down in Melbourne. He's a member of our Live Like Build community and just absolutely kicking goals. But it was actually quite hard to get him to come and sit down in the seat. He, he keeps to himself. He's a bit of a quiet guy. But seriously, the value that he gave through this podcast was off the charts. And he talks a lot about um how he's been able to really build structure trust um communication is huge uh not just in their building business but in life and all this when it's come together really well for him has actually freed up a lot of his time uh, he gets a lot more time with his family and stuff now which is really valuable for him and i think at the end of the day that's what we're all after so uh yeah listen to this one it's a cracker Hey mate, can we touch on your, your team a little bit? Because you you mentioned before we weren't um, before we were recording, like you're very lucky to have like your supervisor and the team that you've got, which allows you to do a lot of stuff now that your old boy couldn't do in his business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's uh, it's funny. So we're not we're not big. I think there's six of us, six or seven of us. Um, made up of sort of on-site guys, carpenters and apprentices. Um, and we've got myself and, and Jess in the office. Uh, so it just um, it helps out with admin and some business development and stuff like that. And I mean, even herself, she's a story. She, she's, she's done a PhD. Um, she was, I'm going to get this wrong, Jess, sorry, an orthoptist, which they know a lot about eyes. <laughs> um, and she got sick of that industry just saying yeah. it was a, a shit show basically. Yeah. Um, and you know, she, is she, she, was she, is she a client? Yep. Yeah. I, yep. I still find that an amazing story. Yeah. So she, um, did our preliminary process and, and jumped on and, and it was funny. Like, um, so you, you, so you had a client that did your preliminary process and thought it was that great that she then come and work for you. Yeah. Well, so I like, yeah, Jess is long story short, educated yeah. and I'm like, I'm like, yep, I was emailing back. Sorry, Jess, I'm in a real hurry. This, that, and the other. Yep, meeting this afternoon, something like that. Um, you don't know anyone who wants a job, do you, or something like that. It was a, it was a throwaway comment in an email. And then um, she wrote an email back and it was this long-winded like <laughs> thing that was like, well, actually, if you mention it, such and such, I'd be really interested if there was a position to apply for or is there someone I could, somewhere I can formally apply for it and stuff like this. I'm sitting there reading it going, is this a piss take or what? She, she's got one up on me here. And... Um, Anyway, we just explored that further, and and then yeah, she's completely changed industries to come and to come and work for us, um, which is good because I have long spoken about the lack of professionalism from top to bottom, like whether yeah. it's trades or you know offices or whatever, just people's experience like can 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 come up like several notches, um, yeah. and it's not hard because there's so much low lying fruit, if you will, for just exam you know opportunity yeah. to do that. And yeah, so she's come on board, and, and yeah, she's just she's steamrolled the office, and it's good. Um, it's been really like I just I I love sitting behind the scenes, live like build now, and seeing all you guys just killing it. And like I I pick up all the little things, and like it's been unreal seeing you do your Friday wins or even just the, the phone conversation we have every now and then because you've really run like what since you bought her in like you've really run with handing stuff over to her and putting systems and processes in place to allow her to do what she needs to do like i think it's fantastic because that's obviously freed your mind up to focus on other it's, things it stems back to that saying dad do everything and uh, mum and dad you know what i mean um and then I, I i sit there and go why can't builders um control their time and and take the kids to sport and do all that sort of stuff like our family's really young so yeah we I, like i want to do that do you know what i mean and and dad did that too like but it, like i played footy on a sunday it was probably the only time he took off to come and watch me play yeah um but yeah certainly the team does that and like ryan is a so our supervisor's been with me so i met ryan at trade school 
Yeah. Um, I did my apprenticeship at the same time. And um, it was funny because he, he, I said to dad, when I was working in dad's building business, I said, look, there's a guy, um, I think he's going to, yeah, I think he's going to be good. He's just, he, he gets it. He, he gets it. Yeah. And um, he said, I'll, I'll come and work for you as long as, as long as you still swing past for a beer as mates. You know, it can't just be work. And um, if you fast forward 17 years to now, that's pretty funny because he's pretty hard to pin down for anything but work. Um, he's like he's like the guy creeping around the job site at 5.30 in the morning writing his list for the day, which is just remarkable. But um, yeah, he... It, so he's been with you 17 years. Yeah. So he, he said to dad and myself, he said, I'll do anything you want, just don't give me a set of plans. Now he's running all our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I laugh, but he's he laughs as well. It's all pretty pretty good. But yeah, it's he's good. So um, you know, and then we've got carpenters. You know, the been with sort of two, three years and all that sort of stuff. Sort but of. you need someone in your team like that, don't you? Like I think I, I one of the first things I tell um, a lot of builders now when they ask me like how do I do what I do like, and I say it's not I can't do it on my own. Like you've no. got to have a team. You've got to understand your numbers. You've got to make sure you're covering your costs so that you can employ other people to give you well, not just time back, but your life back. Absolutely. And, and you'll never, you'll never have an efficient, successful business if you're running around chasing your tail all the time. No. And it's it's it takes an army. Like I, that's where we muck around with saying, but it's it's true. Like yeah. Um. You know, I could I could take on more and more work, and our our process from the office and and you know the administration through to the delivery through to just simple things like i remember when i introduced um sending out agendas for the weekly site meeting and, and making sure that minutes were followed up and i remember ryan looking at me like are you serious can't i just have the meeting and you know what i mean <laughs> and he i you know i see the whites of his eyes and you know you ask him now and he's He's like, he's the, he's loves doing it. He locks himself away Friday afternoons. Yeah. Makes sure he follows through with it all. And it just flows through. And it, because the structure's there, like we can do so gotta, much more yeah. work. Um, <clears throat> I think that's the key word, structure. you gotta you got to have some structure behind things. Yeah. It's funny though, like the growth thing, like you, you mentioned me before, what, what sort of spawned that, but it, that's through everyone. Like the industry has been fairly stagnant for so long. And, and the, the, the attitude is that I've finished my apprenticeship. What's left to learn? Yeah. Um, you know. Speaking well, of I, got, I got my license now. What's left to learn? Yeah, let's just go earn money. Yeah, like that's just all it is, you know. And it's and it's a road to nowhere. Like you see guys who just have that attitude. Hey, I and need they... a drop and bombs button. Like that's a bomb. What about that? You just dropped a bomb. Did I? That yeah, was a, that was good. Well, it is, but they don't. Um, they... That's a Bradley thing. Do you listen to Bradley? The drop and bomb podcast. <laughs> no. It's a bloody cracker, mate. No, so but they don't like. And it's, I mean, it's a generalisation, but. Like Ryan's a perfect example. He didn't want plans put in his hand. Um, you know, the guy can't assume more responsibility if I threw it at him. Like he's just he's he's he can. Like he just he's just a sponge for it. But what first, you know, put a little bit of protest up and I think we're pretty good mates, like we tell us he he'll determine to get stuff too, if like you yeah. know what I mean. But we seeing that now and he, they can see the benefits of it and like we've we've hired stuff off the back of it like we you know if we're recruiting we show show them you know the apps we use the process this is how we do this is so then they're sitting there just looking going what you know what i mean like yeah when you employ new people mm. yeah yeah we had one this, this year matt sort of said I, I asked him what what's what sticks out from where else you've worked he just said it goes just communication like it, yeah it's it's you know what you're up for so and, and that's good and that, that's it's the aim is i mean we're business owners that's our choice but to be able to go home and switch off, you know, um, or take the kids to sport or go on a holiday like I am now or whatever it's going to be is a remarkable thing. And But you want, like, they may not always know. I try and let them know, but you want, actually want that for them as well. Like, guys, this is why we have a pre-start. Yeah. So that you can set up, get your day nailed, like, and then just, just storm it and then go home, know we're under control um, yeah. and do it again the next day. And, and you know what I mean? Like, opportunities are there and, yeah, it's good. Yeah, and that, so that's the full circle back to what I touched on before. Like, you, when once you've got that structure, like if if so many builders and, and traders, but mainly builders, if 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 they put more a bit of time into themselves, understood their running costs, of their business, started charging what they need to charge, have the money in the business to employ the back end staff or the administration staff, you can double or triple the volume of work you do with the same site team by having more structure and you not running around like an idiot trying to keep up with all the administration stuff. Yeah. Like it is, it's a no-brainer. It's like, Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you can read all the books and say, be proactive instead of reactive, all that yeah. stuff, but how? You know yeah. what I mean? There's there's ways to do it. And there, there's just simple key things. Like, if we don't have, um, one of the biggest things for us is the site meetings. Yeah. I, I, I originally thought too, like every week, oh, that's a lot. You, you, you're having those conversations and seeing them anyway. You may yeah. as well structure them, make them a time that fits nicely into your calendar for the duration of the project. Yeah. And theirs. And like, 
there's always stuff to go through. Yeah. But even if it's even if there's not, there is. Like I don't think we've had one yet. That there hasn't been anything to go through that's job related or project related. But you know, even on the ones that are largely nailed and you know maybe not much has changed since the, the week before or you know a few things have fallen in place, whatever. But it's a cup of coffee and a chin wag yeah. or whatever it's got to be. And you're you know building I mean? relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And you know everything's on track. And yeah. Yeah, like you say, there's. there's there's never a time there's nothing to talk about. Like if if, the, if it is lean on, you're always talking about the schedule of the job and what's coming up next and what's being done. Like and yeah. and to me that is just so valuable for the relationship that you build with a client. Like for them to see what's going on, to know what's going on. Um, and I like again, I I think it's that whole um, it's just that structure of everything falling into place. Like by doing that every week, like how easy does it make your handover? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like. I don't, I, and over shouldn't go more than an hour. Yeah, like it, yeah. not you know because they're keen to get in, but you know what I mean it should be that easy. Yeah, they know you've communicated everything that needs to be done is usually done by then anyway. But yeah, and what the obligations are thereafter. You know, here's the keys to your home. Happy yeah. days. All right, to say that I was super pumped that this uh, next guest agreed to come on the Level Up podcast is an understatement. So, the next guest was Matt Risinger. Um, look, I've looked up to Matt. He's he's probably the person that really made me get off my ass uh, maybe, I don't know, three, four, five years ago and start putting myself out there because I saw everything that he was doing. And to have someone that I've looked up to for that amount of time come on my podcast and have a chat to me was just, yeah, it was a massive win for uh, 2023. And look, Matt talks about a lot of things that we all need to be doing. And that is that you don't need to take on every single project. And Look, have a listen to what Matt talks about because he tells a real life story that so many of us in the industry can resonate with and that is what happens when you take on the wrong client. Not everybody is, uh, is our client though too and not everybody yeah. fits in our, in our ethos and our, our similar desire to build houses that are going to last. Some people have a very short, are short-term thinkers and those end up not being great clients are great fits for us. And, you know, yeah. luckily it sounds like you're in a good market and so am I where we can be a little selective and picky uh, and not just go after every job. And, and plenty of meetings that I've been in the last six months, I've said something to the effect of, you know, I just don't think that we're right, the right fit for you as a builder. Uh, I may give you a recommendation to a friend of mine who I think might be a better fit, but from what you're telling me, I don't think that we're going we're gonna to be the best match for you for that what you're looking for. That's really powerful, isn't it? Like being being in a position where you have the confidence to say you're not the client for me. Like that's massive for your business, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I'd um, like to say we always say that real up front, but sometimes we also say, you know, gosh, I would love to work on this. Uh, we've got a two-year wait list. Uh, so if you're willing to give us a deposit, we'd love to give you a call in two years when we free up. <laughs> and those are the people I really don't want to work with, but I don't want to say we don't want to work with you. I had one of those uh, not too long ago that if you want to hear the story, I'll tell you the longer version of it. But uh, yeah, well, know, that's, yeah, that's the that's the polite version. Mate, tell us the story because I, I think this is important. Like I, I really put this out there to builders. Like you, you need to have a strategy to walk away from the clients that you don't, for whatever reason, don't fit with your business model because yeah, if, if your guts is telling you that they're not the right person, all it's going to do is cause a lot of time, heartache, wasted money, um, and you could have been putting that energy into a client that does want to work with you or, or does appreciate right. what you're bringing to the table. That's right. So here's the, here's uh, the fast story. I was at my office one day after hours, it was, you know, five 30, everyone was gone. Uh, and the phone rang and I saw, I saw the caller ID and I was like, huh, that's not recognize that number. It didn't seem like it was a sales call. It, it felt like it was an individual calling. I thought oh, I should, I should grab this. So I get, I field the call and turns out it's a prospect calling the office about a, a build. And uh, we have a, a like a 10 question protocol that whoever answers the phone, like go through these questions with a prospect. You know, how far along in the process are you? Do you have a piece of dirt already? Have you already gauged an architect? Uh, you know, do you have any idea of what budget range you're looking in? Uh, all these questions that kind of anyone who answers the phone can get some basic information. And then if it's, you know, let's say if it's my accounting team that answers the phone, uh, you know, they can pass it on to me or one of my business partners uh, to, you know, field a real sales call. So I get this call. I'm going through the questions uh, with this guy and I'm like, wow, this is a terrific prospect. Like he has a really good budget. 
He seems to really care about well-built construction. Uh, you know, like he's saying all the right stuff. And I was like, this is great. You know, and he, he's already kind of down the road with an architect that I knew and liked. Uh, so this is, I'm thinking this is a, this is terrific. I can't believe I answered the phone. What a win. And then towards the end of the call, he says something like, uh, yeah, I don't think I can get together with you uh, next week after all. Uh, I forgot. I, I got to be in uh, my other town where we're moving from because we're, we're finishing up some some things uh, with this other builder. And I was like, oh, you know, have you built before? What's the story? Well, he goes on to tell me he's suing his builder in this new home that he finished not too long ago. Uh, and he's got to finish up the lawsuit and take care of some things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, wow, I can't believe I was, he, I'm, number one, I'm surprised he told me. <laughs> and number two, yeah. I'm like, I got to dig in a little more here. So I dig in a little more. It turns out his wife is an attorney uh, and there's, and the wife uh, specializes in suing contractors in her firm. Uh, <laughs> and turns out he's got some, he, I don't want to get into the story in case they're listening, yeah. but, or yeah, yeah. I can't imagine you know who they are, but long story short, I get into kind of the specifics of why he's suing the builder. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, I'm so thankful this guy was willing to, to tell me this. And that's when I went into the, yeah, it sounds like a great project. Uh, we're booked out till 2027. Uh, but you know, I'd love to get, get you our contract and take a deposit from you. And then as we free up, as we get closer in 2026, we'd love to call. He's like, Oh, that's not going to work. We got to, you know, we got to move forward sooner than that. I was like, Oh, shucks. That's too bad. I'll be yeah, sure yeah. to not recommend any other builders to you. <laughs> <laughs> like who's my worst enemy. I'll recommend him. Right. Like who would, yeah. who would get a, ref who would you want to possibly refer to somebody who's in process from suing his current contractor? Uh, oh, it was just are. one of those phone calls. Where you're like, wow, I'm, I'm so thankful I got, uh, the real story from this person. So I bet every yeah. contractor has some story like that, where they found out at some point in the process that, wow, this person would be, would have been incredibly difficult to work with. I'm so thankful I dodged that bullet. All right. So our last one in the uh, best of 2023 is Adrian Ramsey. Uh, he's a building designer from Sunshine Coast. Uh, I've actually become good mates with Adrian and we, we talk quite regularly. He's got just incredible values and the, part in the podcast that we really um, connected on was where Adrian talks about land whispering, actually taking the time out to go and visit clients' blocks of land and connect with it and how he uses that connection to then design people's dream homes. And it was an incredible conversation. It taught me a lot. And look, it's definitely, since that podcast, it's definitely made me think about things a lot differently and has sparked a few conversations with the architects and designers that I work with. So land whispering was actually a conversation between myself and a, an amazing architect in um, Marin County in California, Brad Hubble. And uh, Brad Hubble from Hubble Daily, absolutely beautiful architect, lovely, lovely human being. And him and I having this conversation and we're, we're, I was telling him about on my podcast, Jeffrey Dungan, who's um, an architect from Alabama. And Jeffrey was saying to me, you know, um, well, you know what it's like. You look out across a site and, you know, the building kind of just stands up in front of you. And really all we do is fill boxes with light and air. <laughs> and I went, I do know what it's like. I know what it's like to stand there and envisage a house and see that house sitting in amongst the trees or sit, wherever it is, sitting on the beachfront, whatever. And I was saying this to Brad, and Brad and I were having a laugh about this, and I'll tell you one other little story with it, um, about, you know, each place, if, especially acreage land, um, each piece of land has a feeling. It's got an energy in the ground. It's got something that you can tap into. But you probably have to get to a quiet space or centered and, you know, be just be calm down in that space. Now, for us ADHD guys, that's not so easy. But <laughs> no, but I, I, I hear what you're saying. I Get to yeah. the space where you actually start to tune into what's around and you're listening to the bird song and you're looking at how the light comes through the trees, say, and you're looking at how the winds shifted things, where the waters run and all these things on the land. And there's 
places that you just walk over and you know that isn't a spot that you'd ever consider for a house. And there's other spots that you imagine other things happening in. Not just you're not just looking for a house site. You're looking for an environment, your place making. You know, you've got these boundaries that you can work with and you're looking to make a place of community, you know, connection and security for a family or for whatever it is. We go with the family. And one of the other things with that is is what's sacred about those spaces. And if we look to what, say, for instance, a space that might give you the most amazing spot to picnic um, or to be away from your house, but be you see from your house maybe, but it's like a space that just gives a whole nother energy. And this comes back to the story I was telling him at the time. So another good friend of mine, amazing architect um, out of Austin, Texas, and I won't use his name because the story's pretty funny. Um, I'm talking to him one day about Frank Lloyd Wright, and he goes, and I, I can use my language. Yeah. I go, I said to him something about Frank Lloyd Wright, and he goes, that Frank Lloyd Wright was an asshole. And I'm like, mate, he was a bloody top architect of, you know, the last century. And he goes, yeah, but he was an asshole. And I'm like, what do you mean he was an asshole? And he goes, oh, well, what an arrogant bastard, you know, da, 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 da. And I said, tell me more, you know, bring it on, tell me more. And he goes, well, take that falling water house. And I'm like, yeah. And he, I, I said, most famous house in the world, you know. And he goes, yeah, exactly. He goes, there's this family, the Craftmans, who used to come up from Pittsburgh and sit on Bear Run Creek. And they used to summer on this rock and swim in the pools and all the rest. That prick put a house on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, as much as I was like, you're pissed off. I, I go, this is a very valid point. He goes, he's got acres of country there he could have put a house on and they could have still picnicked on that rock, swam on it, done that every summer. But that arrogant son of a bitch put a house on it. And I'm like, interesting, eh? That's going to uh, get some people talking. Yeah, well, this is when you go back to, is it a sacred spot? <laughs> yeah. And is the spot sacred enough that you would preserve it and not put a house on it, but put a house in its proximity so that it became available? And so when you're considering your land and you're feeling for all that energy in the land, look for the sacred spots and what are they sacred for and how would you use them? And it might not be for a house. So I look at that and I go, this is part of our land whispering process. <coughs> Brad and I got into this conversation about this and we started talking about different land we'd walked on and the way different land ignites us and the way we see things happen in it. And so we expanded that conversation to quite a few other architects. And um, there's currently four of us around the globe and uh, we all practice it in a, in a semi-structured process, um, how to whisper a piece of land, how to get it one with it, look for what it is. You often don't want the client there. You might have had the client there. What you want is to be there on your own often. It's lovely to be there before the sun comes up. Yeah. It's lovely to be there after the sun's gone down. Mate, I'm, I'm <laughs> like, like as camping. you're talking, I'm like, we've just recently purchased a farm up north on, yep. the, on the ocean. And uh, I'm just picturing as you're talking and thinking, like, fuck, like, this is, this is awesome. Like, because, like, like, and so we've, we've been camping on this spot because it's the one, like, we just love it's the best it. spot. And, and, but, and we were thinking that's where we would let's, possibly let's, put a house. Yeah, but let's now, put a house right on that spot. <laughs> now you'll consider. Now I'm thinking, shit, we maybe need to. Because like, maybe that spot is for that casualness, for that mm. openness, and for that, you know, maybe it's a fire pit, maybe it's something like that, mm. that you can still engage the spot before you go and put a bloody dirty house on it yeah. that changes the speed wherever it goes forever yeah you know and like this thing of walking over it and letting yourself feel it and becoming in touch with it and listening sitting and listening and listening in the morning and listening in the afternoon it's not a one visit wonder it's like it's actually going and, and digging in and looking what the wind does and seeing when the birds come and where they fly in and out of, where do the, you know, roos go or whatever there is, what other stuff's on the land. How are you honouring all that? Yeah. Because that's our responsibility to the planet because whatever we do is going to change it. 
whatever we do, and we're going to do something, is going to change it. So yeah. how do we have the least impact with what we do to change it and the most impact for the humans that come into it and then create this incredible environment? So that's our land whispering process, and we'll, we'll do that for even if we're looking at... Um, say a, a, an original house that's already on something is where did the other people make magic outside of that house what happens yeah. where where's the dynamic and where does the land allow for that dynamic to happen um so it's a i love it it's i kind of go it's a bit of a woo woo process but it's not no i love it I it's, think it's fantastic yeah it's it's a responsibility is the way i see it i actually feel like so doing this pack process that we have um I believe it has made me such a, a, a better builder. It's made me understand design and architecture a lot more. But I love I love all this stuff because I – and again, I, I feel that so many builders don't – like they just think they're there to build the house. Yeah, like, pour concrete, put up block, put up brick. Like this stuff just walls. adds so much more value to yeah. – everybody like when everybody's on the same page and working towards this and like all this all the like mate the last 10 minutes of what you've been talking about just resonates so much with me because i've i, I actually like i know everything is driven by costs of course and yep. i know that everyone like my my thing at the moment or something that i really think about a lot is like the way that Australia is developing, and like they, we, we, there's all these master plan communities popping up everywhere, and the, the houses are like boundary to boundary, and they've got enough room out the back just to have maybe a pool and a little bit of yard. And the developers feel that because, like, so many, every so many homes, they've got these big parks, uh -huh. no one's connected. Like, parents aren't going to send their kids out to play at the park that's two streets away. And no, um, not today. Like, no yeah. one can go and sit in their backyard now and look at a, a beautiful garden yep. or a bit of a view because you're looking at your neighbor's fence. Like, What happened to when we didn't have fences? Yeah. What happened to when you had a house and it sat there and there was no fence on the to the road? There was So there was no barrier to entry. There was no barrier to entry to your neighbors. In fact, if they mowed half your lawn or you mowed half their lawn, you wouldn't really know other than it was mowed because <laughs> there was no boundary line. Um what happened to when we lived like that, where we put up a house and then we got, I don't know whether we got more and more fearful or whether society got sicker and sicker or whether both things happened and suddenly like we're living with fences, walls. Um, well, mate, we've got to it as a society where a lot of neighbours don't even know each other. Yeah, Like exactly. don't even talk. Like yeah. the, um, but the, like where I'm going with that is it doesn't matter how... Like it seems these days, it doesn't matter how big the blocks are in like mm -hmm. residential areas, people are just making the biggest house, biggest they, house can. they can on it. Fill it so up. So I would make, and like I, we're at a point now um, in our journey, like if anything ever happened or we, we had to buy a smaller house or whatever, like I know some housing estates now are doing 280 square meter blocks or 320 square meter blocks and that stuff, and they're filling the whole thing with house. Yep. I would rather stick a tiny house yeah. like on that block yeah. and create and these have amazing more. outdoor yeah. spaces, 100%. fire pits, pool yep. area. So that even though you've got a small block- A you bathroom can, and a bedroom. You can still do what you're talking about. Yeah. You've still got somewhere that you can create special times and yep. sit outside and watch the sunrise and the sunset. Like, we do live in Queensland, 330 sunshine days a year for anybody who's on listen. <laughs> <laughs> but look, it's, I don't know, it's- I'm with you. I, I'm I love with you. everything you're talking about. Yeah. I think it's very just, powerful. All right, guys, so that's a wrap. Look, I take my hat off to everybody that, uh, look, takes time out to listen to my podcast. I know that time is the most valuable thing we have and look to know that you guys and girls are all taking time out to sit and listen to my podcast it means the absolute world to me and I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. So look, I'm going to keep delivering. I'm going to take this thing next level in 2024. Shay and I have got some incredible guests already lined up and we're going to be expanding. We're, uh, we're, we're going wider. I know all the things that I've done in my life, in my business to get to where I am and be able to do everything that I'm doing. So I'm reaching out and bringing on guests that I know will help you do the same things that I'm doing. So it's not going to be all just about building. We're going to be talking about all types of stuff, especially personal development. So look, 
make sure you join us. Uh, you continue listening and um, yeah, let's uh, level up the building industry. Are you ready to build smarter, live better and enjoy life? Then head over to livelifebuild.com forward slash elevate to get started. Everything discussed during the Level Up podcast with me, Dwayne Pierce, is based solely on my own personal experiences and those experiences of my guests. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. We recommend that you obtain your own professional advice in respect to the topics discussed during this podcast.